Rivian's Amazon problem is the title of this slide. And if you're somebody who's invested in Rivian stock, then be forewarned because this isn't the usual group wank bull thesis that you read on Reddit. This is a critical look at the company using rules that we apply across all companies that we look at. So the last time that we took a peek at what Rivian was up to was back in October 2021. You can see at that time they had a market cap greater than GMC and Ford, uh, and they didn't have any revenues. I think GMC and Ford probably pushing over $120 billion in revenue, so clearly overvalued. And since then, the market cap of Rivian has dropped from $80 billion to $17 billion. Now, one of the ways that we value, or let's say do relative valuations on companies in a particular niche is something called a simple valuation ratio. So it's these companies don't have positive earnings, so P&E doesn't work so well. So we look at revenue growth as a proxy for market share captured. So for Rivian, Lucid, and Tesla, we've calculated that here. We take the market cap, we divide that by annualized revenue. So last quarter revenues times four, that gives us what's called the simple valuation ratio or SVR. Here you can see that Rivian is just under Tesla, let's say around Tesla, which means it's not overvalued as it was before. Uh, it's valued, um, of course, Tesla could also be considered undervalued. It, it's all relative, right? But you can see Lucid stands out. So we did a presentation just recently on Lucid, and that's certainly a firm that we'd never invest in. Now, Rivian looks a lot different, and the um, event that prompted this presentation was their 2022 results. So they produced 24,337 vehicles, delivered 20,332 vehicles, all right? So then we have $1.658 billion in revenues. That's great. Amazon accounted for around 21% of that number. So $343 million of Rivian's revenues came from Amazon. So if we just divide their total revenues by the number of vehicles they delivered, we'd get the average cost of a delivered vehicle to be around $81,546. Question we ask here is, how many vans did Rivian sell Amazon? For those of you that are interested, this is a look at the van. This gentleman here does very entertaining reviews of vehicles on YouTube, Doug, and you can check out his video on the uh, delivery van from Amazon that he reviewed. So it actually exists. It's actually being used, and Rivian said they've uh, delivered 10 million packages with these vans so far. So the question is, well, how many vans do they have? We know the number is greater than 1,000, but that's all we know. So what we can do here is uh, start to play with some numbers, uh, back of the napkin math. So entry price range for Rivian's consumer vehicle used to be around $67,500. Now it's around $73,000. It's quite expensive for a pickup or a sports utility vehicle. On the other hand, you have Tesla Cybertruck in the upper right-hand corner here. This is a table taken from that article we did back in October of 2021. So these numbers certainly could have changed. But um, just so you get the general idea of reservations and deposits and whatnot, you can see that Tesla's Cybertruck reservations with a $100 deposit amount that's uh, relatively useless in terms of uh, assuring that consumers will be buying your vehicle, but that's Tesla. So the people are certainly lining up to buy Tesla's latest, whatever Tesla has, because they do a brilliant job of marketing by not spending any money on marketing, whilst other firms need to do that. So uh, let's assume Rivian was most likely filling orders from their deposit customers. Of course they were, right? They had, at least back then, close to 50,000 deposits. Let's assume an average sales price of 70 k So that's sort of between the old entry price and the new entry price. That would give us around 18,800 vehicles sold because we've simply taken the revenues they, they've received and minus Amazon's revenues, that would imply that 1,532 vans were sold to Amazon. Well, what we did here in that little table you see there uh, next to bullet point four, if they sold, because we know how the total amount of revenues that came from Amazon, if they sold 1,000 vans to Amazon, they would have received $343,000 of vans. Seems pretty high, right? 
Uh, 2,000 vans seems more reasonable, $171,500, but still very high. 3,000 vans at $114,000 a piece, that seems more like in the range of what they sold. So if we do that math, we can say perhaps they sold 3,000 va vans to Amazon at that price, $114,000. Then 17,332 consumer vehicles sold at an average price of around $76,000. That seems to make sense. Why is this important? Well, as we said in our previous article, Amazon is a com key component of their success, and it goes much deeper than you might think. So if you start to dig into the SEC filings, you'll find all sorts of rich information. And for example, you have the Amazon contracts that they actually signed, the work orders with Amazon. You can go through there and read recently released changes. You could actually do a diff between the paragraphs that have changed to see, to get insights into what verbiage changes they've made and what those could mean. It's all very interesting for those people who want to do that level of due diligence. But if you simply look at cancellation conditions, which we've listed out here, every single one of these, and you can read these for yourselves, every single one of these comes with predefined success factors. And Amazon says, for example, this uh, pre-SOP deadline condition said that the deadline for them to, del to deliver the uh, initial vans needed to be by this particular date. And then when you read the work order, you see where they said, well, you may have missed the date, but that's okay. We'll just let that slip. So what happens when they trigger these conditions is that Amazon comes to the ne negotiation table with a lot of leverage because this gives, gives them the right to cancel that entire work order. Will they do that? No. But what they will do is sit down at the negotiating table and work everything in their favor. And you can see here where they explicitly say that. This is taken from Amazon's 10K. We have the ability to exercise significant influence over Rivian through our equity investment. We'll talk about that. Our commercial arrangement for the purchase of electric vehicles. That's 100,000 electric vehicles they said that they would purchase. And one of their employees serving on Rivian's board of directors. So when we think about consumers versus Amazon. So Rivian is a company that you need to think of it as two primary components. One being the consumer vehicle segment, the other being Amazon delivery segment, both having their own needs. So Amazon, as we said, owns 17% of Rivian and a board seat, so they command leverage in that alone. But think about where Rivian's priorities are going to be in the coming years as they try to satisfy all those conditions that Amazon put on the table as part of that work order. And ask yourself this. What's the demand for a $73,000 truck once deposits have been exhausted? So you can see here on the right, this is the estimate of what a monthly payment looks like for a $73,000 truck that you put down 10% and you have excellent credit. $1,300 a month is no small chunk of change. I was reading yesterday that the used car and new car interest rates, so anywhere from 8 to 11%, that's quite high. So what's the demand going to be like on the consumer side? And if they don't have that demand, and let's say they do great on the Amazon side, how is that going to affect their margins? Speaking of which, this is very important. It's something we covered in great detail in our Lucid video, and I suggest that you watch that. I'll put a link to that at the end of this video for you to watch because it's quite interesting and it approaches this same problem. People talk about Rivian needing to achieve profitability, and you may pull up this chart here on Yahoo, which shows their uh, revenues compared to their losses, but profitability can never be achieved if the cost of goods sold is greater than revenues. You can't produce a product and then sell it for less than it costs you to produce, and that's what's happening here. Now, the percentage numbers you see there along the bottom, read that from left to right. So that's the percentage of money that Rivian is recouping with their sales. It's increasing over time. Eventually, when that hits 100%, they still won't have a business. That means that you produced a product and you sold it for the same price that it cost to produce. That's not profitable. Plus, this is gross. Then you still need to go down and start the money they'll need to spend on general and administrative, R&D, marketing, sales, all those things. So 
they're a long, long way from profitability. Our approach is typically never to even get involved at all in any way, shape, or form with a company that hasn't achieved yet a positive gross margin. You can see here that Rivian addresses this. They say, the pressure on gross profit from limited volumes will continue in the near term. Yeah, of course it will. And then they say, uh, new in-vehicle technologies uh, achieve commercial cost savings on material costs and ramp our overall production levels. That will lead to a positive gross margin. Again, scaling. If demand isn't there, you can't achieve economies of scale. If for some reason Amazon decides to start pulling back on the number of vans that they're buying or consumers just aren't interested in a $73,000 pickup truck and they've built all this hoping that the demand would arrive, then that's a problem. Now, people are always quick to say, but what about Tesla, okay? Great, we can pull up Tesla's financials going to the uh, SEC database you can see here from 2009 on the, on the right-hand side all the way to 2013 on the left. See how they lost, what, nine hundred, close to a billion dollars in, that says, five years following their IPO. I don't think that's correct. I think their IPO was not in 2008, maybe 2011, but you get the picture. So five years of operation. See, Tesla's losing money, but you're looking at the wrong numbers. This is the Tesla difference. Look at total revenues, total cost of goods sold, total cost of revenues. Look at their gross profit, positive gross profit every single year from that early onwards. That's how Tesla and how that's accomplished is through very competent manufacturing capabilities. So when we talk about Rivian, what's the likely outcome? Okay, whatever benefits Amazon provided they stick around, is the likely outcome. So Amazon is the big swinging dick at the table. Uh, so far, it seems to be going well, though there was a mention that Rivian made. They say, we intentionally slowed the commercial van production line this quarter. Well, fair enough, but pay close attention to that. Really, Amazon's revenues, which they reported in their 10K, hopefully they do that on a quarterly basis so you don't just find out once a year. Those are a proxy for the success of selling vans to Amazon, and they're a double-edged sword. If those increase as a proportion of total revenues, that means Amazon gets more and more leverage. Now, you might say, well, Amazon has an ownership stake in Rivian, and that will make sure that they do what's in the best interest of Rivian. No. Amazon's Rivian position right now is worth $2.9 billion. That's peanuts. That's absolutely nothing, and that's 17% of the company. Amazon is going to be focused on Amazon. Now, that's somewhat of a good thing. If Rivian runs into financial problems, Amazon could provide further financing under conditions favorable to Amazon, of course, or maybe acquire the remaining assets at fire sale prices, especially if the consumer side of the business isn't doing so good. So what's the best case scenario for Rivian? If you're an investor in Rivian stock, what are you really looking for here? Well, you're looking for customer satisfaction to be managed on both sides of the business. They need to appease Amazon and consumers as well. Both sides of the business need to scale in response to demand, with both sides showing continued demand, and they need to turn gross margins positive as they scale on both sides. So if it turns out to be too expensive to meet all of Amazon's conditions, that's going to erode the margins on the consumer side. So Amazon uh, will only be their sole customer for four years, all right? That's contractually after the date they first delivered Vans. Then Amazon has first right of refusal on Vans for another two years. That means that they can purchase all Vans coming off the production line unless they say they don't want to. So for a, a fair while, Amazon is going to be a big component of Rivian's success. And of course, they agree to that. But as risk-averse tech investors, we never invest in firms that have a single customer, especially one as large as Amazon, relative to their uh, to their partner, you have to look at that relative size. If the companies were the same size, that would be a lot different, but you look at this relative size, and it's incredible just how large Amazon is compared to Rivian. So Amazon will focus on Amazon's interests. If you're an investor in Rivian, what are you actually looking for? So the next Tesla doesn't exist, and I'll put a link to a piece we did on the next Tesla in the description of this video, and it looks at just that. You want EV exposure? Buy Tesla. So that's a company that's already figured things out. A lot of the risk has been removed. So when Rivian 
automotive manages to achieve marginally positive gross margins as Polestar has, then we'll come around for another look. Until then, we see this stock as being far too risky for our liking. Um, I put up the video here that you might be interested in Lucid, but before you watch that, please click the Nanalyze logo there. Support us. Subscribe to our channel. Thanks for taking the time to watch this today.